there and give your feedback to the person that did the pitch. This is very important. I'm really hoping that all of our businesses tonight receive an investment deal, but some may not. And they need to get that feedback in order to do further pitches down the road. So visit our in-kind sponsors in the back and definitely rate the pitch that you think did the best or give them feedback to help them do a pitch in the future. Uh, we have Justin Freight from BDO, SR and ED. Thank you for joining us and uh, donating your services. Um, I don't know if we have a representation from Fire Dog this evening, but Fire Dog uh, came on board to give marketing support, $5,000 of marketing support, which is very crucial. Grant Thornton, I don't know if we have any representation from Grant Thornton, but thank you very much. And Doug Shanks from Cheetos, he's, uh, he's wearing many hats this evening. Mary's gonna, <laughs> thank you. Mary's gonna explain what Doug Shanks is helping us with, and he's also provided legal services. So thank you so much for uh, donating your time. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Mary now, and she's gonna talk a little bit more about the process that we're gonna be going through this evening and more about the secret angel. So, Mary. Thank you very much, and I am really excited to see. We do have, I think it's 17 or 18 angels in the room. We'd originally planned for 21, a few of them could not make it, but I'm really excited to have them in the room. The process is they're going to be hearing the pitches, and I would like to know, if at all possible, if any one of the angels are interested in anyone, I'm not saying making a commitment, because naturally you will have a host of questions and due diligence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we do have set aside the boardroom here at the Victoria Inn, just near the front lobby. If you do want to meet with any one of the pitches and, and talk to them a few minutes, or contact me and I will arrange a time or arrange a meeting with you and the pitches. So we are hoping to um, to get as many as many or as much support for as many of the pitches as possible. So I, I do want to thank also the event supporters. We have T-Baytel, the Northwestern Ontario Innovation Centre, and the, the Network of Angels for Ontario. I really like the, the, the fact that we've had a number of partners, a number of sponsors, and event supporters. Without that, we could not have pulled this off. And there's no way I would have been able to do this without Melissa, so I wanted to thank you for that as well. <laughs> our, our event supporter for tonight is CEDC, the Community Economic Development Ambassadors Northwest with Mark Detwater and the Chronicle Journal. Okay, so the process for the questions. We have at this table here, we have Mark Detweiler, Doug Shanks, Larry Jackson, and Karen Grant. They will be asking the questions that normally the angels would probably ask because some of them have done some investment and some of them are very familiar with the investment process. And the question I keep getting all the time is why are the angels secret? It's a smaller community, we know a lot of people, we know each other, and the angels don't want to be inundated with investment. Imagine if you were an angel investment and you came out and said, I do private investment for small, medium, new businesses. You would be inundated with calls. So to eliminate that, we don't really say who the angels are. So when you're doing the presentation, just think of them as a whole room full of great people and no Kevins. <laughs> also, for, and, and tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Scott Gills from T. Baytel, who um, is going to say a few words. He's the director of sales for T. Baytel, and he's our, our event partner. Scott. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, not only for T. Baytel, but I'm also a proud uh, board member for Northwest Ontario Innovation Center and the great work that Judy and her, and her folks do here. But as you know, t uh, is very much about supporting our community and we currently support over 100 community events, organizations and nonprofit groups throughout Thunder Bay. Um, that includes art, culture and heritage, but it also includes business community. We're uh, very uh, all about continued strengthening our ties in the neighborhood 
and by nurturing our strategic relationships and business partnerships. We are proud of these relationships and what, we've, uh, what they mean to our community and region. So at TV Tell, it's really all about our community and recognize that, our, that a really healthy and strong community benefits everyone. So we uh, really support the innovation and the people who work in, and build this healthy, strong community. And such is the case of this Secret Angel event tonight, who focuses on innovative businesses and entrepreneurs. So we live in your neighborhood, and that's what makes TBA Tell different. So I have the privilege of uh, introducing the first pitch presentation this evening. It's Mr. Sean Whitney. He has traveled all the way here from Terrace Bay. He's seeking uh, uh, own investments for his product known as the Kelboost. And it's, a, it's the ultimate kayak accessory. Now I had the opportunity along with Mary to preview a lot of the uh, pitches before tonight's event. And uh, I really believe that you'll see the creativity and the passion that uh, Sean brings to his product. So let's wel welcome Sean to the stage. Good evening to everybody. I hope there's some paddlers in the room. Are you unloading your boat? You're spending lots of time and money packing in small little dry bags, or maybe you want to bring some extra gear, but you can't, your hatches are too small, or you're just tired of roughing. What if I said I'm going to make your paddling experience easier, more enjoyable, a lot drier, and a lot safer? My name is Sean Whitney. My company is Mar Wilderness Pod. I'm the inventor of the kayak caboose, the last dry gear solution you will ever need. It is simple as pack and go. With this large hatch for easy packing and organizing, unique hull, easy to tow, quick release tether if you need something out in the water, multi uses, multi seasons. In the United States alone, there are 8.5 million recreational kayakers expected to grow to 13.5 million of the year 2020. Canoers are holding steadfast at 20.3 million. This industry is $4 billion in the United States alone. 48% of these re recreational kayakers are between the ages of 29 and 55. These are the consumers we want to target. They want easy, they want quality, and they want affordability. We have sold our thermoform units around the world uh, as, as far as Norway and even with the Norwegian Polar Institute. We have hooked up with key players with this new pricing we're about to bring. We've hooked up an Alpine shop in Missouri and Illinois. A great connection with Yak Gear out of Houston, Texas. Costing was always the issue. It wasn't the product or the uses. He was bringing this cost down. So what we plan on doing is bring a new service into Northwestern Ontario, and that's rotational mode. And by doing this, we're going to cut our, cut our cost of manufacture by 70%. We're going to reduce our outsourcing by 90%. We're going to gain 100% quality control. Where we have to be with this, and, uh, and we plan on being there this August, is the biggest outdoor retail show in North America, that's Salt Lake City. This show showcases 1,400 vendors and over 46,000 buyers from around the world. This is where the caboose will get its most exposure, this will where I gain most, most of my contacts and hard sales. So we have a small team, but they're uh, but it's a good team. And myself, I started working at 15 hammer and spikes on a railway. Spent five years in the military as a naval weapons tech. Worked in the pulp mill. I've got some experience with steam fitting and gas fitting. My wife brings to the table. She has HR and payroll background. Our two sales reps that we just brought into the company, they're outdoor enthusiasts. They excel in paddling, triathlons, good, good, and all around good salespeople. So today, as we do have a US patent, as we're patent pending in Canada, so we're moving the process to rotational molding. I've been in contact with Bill Bragg, our Yak Gear in Houston, Texas. Uh, he's indicated once we get a plant set up, He's looking for a smaller version of the caboose for an actual fish live well. Um, he's also indicated to assisting me with his contact buyers in the 2,000 retail stores he's in in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. 
So today, uh, gentlemen, I'm asking $425,000 for an equity stake of 25%. I do have another uh, company locally that's willing to come in and bring that total capital up to 250000 This money will be spent on purchasing equipment such as two new molds, rotational molding machine, plastic, uh, vending machine, uh, anything associated with, with getting us going. Uh, we project in the first year, after hitting the first trade show, or the first show in Salt Lake City, sales of 1,500, revenue of around 330,000, but I know this is gonna snowball, and we expect in year three, about 6,000 units, and that's probably on the, on the low side, and revenue, a gross revenue of 1.3 million. So if I leave you in any ending today, uh, it, it's the caboose is as simple as pack and go. And my name is Sean Whitney, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or, or concerns you have. I thank you very much. Yes, I have a US, yes, yes, yeah. I have a US uh, patent, yeah, patent ready in Canada. And you own it? Yes. And who was the inventor? Me. Yeah. So was it an uh, ECT patent? It's utility patent. Sorry? It's utility patent. It took three years. On the patent, um, in, in how possible is it for someone to take the basic concept Caboose for a, for a kayak, modify it slightly, and company with the, the large kayak sales already modifies it and puts its own product in the market. The competition. Yeah, it's a possibility. I, I've got so many. I've got 21 claims on this patent. Uh, I have lots of different configurations, not just the product itself, but the hitch. It's a very simple hitch on it right now, but I do have other configurations, other hitches. Uh, there's other additives on this that aren't on this caboose, but it's on the patent, such as wheels um, and certain things like that. Um, you know, it's like anything else, I suppose, if somebody wants to try to copy, it's my deal <coughs> just to go after them. Uh, and I just certainly will do that. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's like anything else, I suppose, if somebody wants to try to do it, maybe the overseas people, but yeah, I'll definitely keep an eye on that. And, uh, if, if I, uh understood your uh, your ask uh, Sean of uh, 125 to 25 that means your valuation is 500,000 the company today yes uh, I value that with with uh, with what I've done with thermoforming the molds uh, the digital drawings the inventory I have right now the patent how am I putting a price on the patent nobody in the world is doing this nobody has a product like this out in the world how do I value that Eight years of working on it. Um, to me, that's that's that, and that's valuation for me. So. Hi, Sean. Nice to see you again. Oh, yeah. Uh, my question relates to how the investors would get their money back and when. Can okay. you give me an idea if you thought that through yet? Mm -hmm. I cer I certainly did. Um, the minute this company takes off to these shows. And the minute that we're operating, the minute that we're in the black, the investor will get his money back before I even take it back. Uh, and I'm hopefully that's going to be within a year, year and a half, year two. Just on a follow up on that, then, would that be buying their shares back, or would it simply be a matter of giving their initial investment back and then they would remain a shareholder? Well, I think it's something that we'd have to discuss. I mean, I'm up for open, you know. You know, it's whatever makes you happy, makes me happy. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm up with open. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. So, so if I understand, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if I understand it, then your your plan is to sell to to resellers. So I'm you're going to sell it to retailers. Sorry, retailers. <coughs> uh, I noticed that that you've got. That you've got two retailers in Canada kind of targeted. Um, are either of them Mountain Equipment Co-op? 
I've talked to them in the past. It was a margin I couldn't get to. Okay, and, in, and with your new process? A uh, new process, the margin's going to be above what they want. So it's really going to open up the, yes. the world for you? Yes. Um, and, and, and so you're, I mean, according to your um, presentation, you want to roll this out well beyond North America. Oh, yes. Uh, but you've got two sales reps. I got two sales reps in the states, um, both couples, um, and and we do, and and we do uh, uh, know the need to bring more professionals on as the company grows. Um, marketing people, maybe more professional salespeople, sales manager. Uh, and we do recognize all this. So you had a nice gross margin there, but we didn't see when you were going to hit break even. So when is that? Well, break even to set up a plant like this. Uh, uh, it's. To buy the machinery that I'm looking at right now um, is uh, close to $125,000. Um, break even with, with, is what the projections are at up here. Uh, should be year one, a year one and a half. Now, I could be wrong there, but I, I think this has been, like, once it's out there, like, there's been limited exposure to this, and it's only it's only because we're doing uh, uh, all the stuff ourselves. But I've had it out there, and I've been in symposium and stuff like that. And, and uh, so I think once we get to the major shows, I think it's just going to last off. Do you want one more question then for Sean? Do you have any more? Just the, last one. The, the investment, 125000 Maybe I Maybe I missed it, uh, Sean. What, okay. the, what is the, uh, the, the fund, what are the funds to be used for? Okay, the, uh, the 125 we use for uh, purchasing two new molds. Um, those run usually anywhere from twenty to 40000 uh, The rotation in the machine I'm looking at, is out of right now there's one out of uh, McGregor, Manitoba. Um, they have brought on a bigger machine. This is actually an extra machine. I've talked to their sales rep uh, on an STP row rotational molding. It's a good machine. That'll probably come in around 30,000. Um, plastic to start up is a minimum probably five to ten tons. That's going to come in around 38,000. Uh, vending machine around 5,000. Industrial sewing machines around $3,500. Okay. I did answer your question. I threw out a time. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. This is the first time we've done an event like this. I didn't anticipate how anxious I would feel. I feel like there's this bit of tension in the room. Like, is so you're gonna get the deal. And when you're sitting in your room watching Dragon's Dead, I'm usually yelling at the screen at that point. No, ask this one. No, why didn't you answer it that way? But Sean, you did a really great job. So thank you very much for doing that. I felt like we should have had a comedian MC this, just to lighten the mood. So I'll, I'll tell one joke that my, my five-year-old really loves. So um, <laughs> um, what kind of music do elves like? Here, this is the part where you say, what kind? <laughs> Rap music. Oh. <laughs> I won't do that again, I promise. <laughs> but we really do need a comedian next time we do something like this. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next um, pitch presentation. I'd like to call up Randy Kopacek, and he is from Paving the Future. So, Randy, come on up. and I'm the founder of the company called Paving the Future. Traditional asphalt paving in North America, the multi-billion dollar business became the problem and created major environmental issues. So far the efforts made to correct this problem are not very successful and didn't make any financial sense. The best way to correct this problem are the paving stones. <clears throat> but pavers are expensive and installation is costly. But paving the future has a solution. Imagine if I told you you don't have to pick up this paver ever again. 
let me present you the short video. Segmental pavers have been used for thousands of years. The Romans built roads with them that still exist today. Typically, the paved surface is formed by preparing the paving stone off-site in a factory, transporting the cured stones to the paving site, and then manually placing each stone individually on a prepared bed. These additional steps in manufacturing and transportation result in this paving technique being very costly and often overlooked. The machines introduced in the last two decades only assist in placing already made paving stones. What if there was a paving machine that could accept castable material, mold that material into paving stones, and place them on site in one easy step. This already built prototype shows the feasibility of such a system. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> this mobile paving unit rolls out the pavers like a carpet. Let's do the three steps in one. Cut in the cost in half or more. The pavers are generally way stronger and last longer. This mobile unit is not only for the driveways, it's for the commercial use as well, like paving the roads, streets, large parking lots, airports, and so on. Paving industry. Paving industry just start opening the doors for the new way of paving. In 2012, was introduced the <coughs> new transportation bill and the paving stones were included in it. Contractors, landscaping firms are in favor of the automation. North American, paving stock industry and they, uh, for, uh, they uh, marketing efforts building the solid grounds for the paving in the future to enter the market. Company is looking for $300,000 to build a commercial <coughs> demonstration unit, now the money to be used for some coverage in uh, international patents and the marketing. I'm here today to ask the investors to get involved in this project and bring this company to the next level. Thank you. understand what your go-to-market strategy is. Are, is the intent to sell machines to individuals? Is it to, and is it pitched at the low end, that is people who are putting in driveways? Or is it at the governmental end where they're building roads? Overall, it's at the both ends. What the companies are looking to manufacture the paving machines. Or Sell the licensing. At this moment, I won't have a, any correct answer. We're just looking to build a demonstration unit so we can show some. Prototype was built and tested. Randy, I've got a question for you. You're looking for $300,000 and uh, I'm wondering whether or not that's going to be uh, used for buying shares in a company, or is it for debt with conversion to shares, or what are you thinking of? Company don't have any debt, and this money will be used to build the demonstration unit, cover some international patents, and for the marketing. Sorry, my question more relates to, if I'm an investor and I've got $300,000, am I going to then uh, put that money into the company and get shares back? And if so, what percentage of shares? 
Uh, yes, that's a plan. Comes to the percentage. I don't have an answer for it now. Maybe discuss later on. So, Randy, this is, uh, this is actually very compelling. Uh, do you have any idea what the speed of laying the stones will be on the commercial model? Do you, is it design? Like, do you have the design? Do you have the do you? Or, or are you still in uh, commercialization mode? Uh, the both. Both. The the seventy percent of the design is done. Okay. And it comes to the speed, uh, let's say eighteen feet wide unit can pave about the four thousand square feet a day. Okay. So the status of your patents then. Um, have you filed anywhere yet? U.S. patent was issued and all the 28 claims were granted and uh, Canadian patent pending. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one here. Uh, it's the same question I asked before for Sean, and that is, uh, how will the investors get their money back and when? Company expecting to get some returns within two years. On a selling the machines or licensing. What is, what is the, what do you expect the cost of a machine to be to market, and how does that compare to uh, what people are, what companies that are paving already spending? Is this a profit center for them, or is it? What's the cost of the machine? Well, it really depends what size of the machine, right? The principle stays the same. The question is how wide the path would be. Uh, comes to the customers like uh, contracting companies, landscaping firms. Uh, they looking at uh, the speed and uh, replacing the labor, right? So they can go with their paying project lower. Uh, Four thousand square feet a day. Just like to remind, all they paying is a, for the concrete to be delivered to the site. So for example, if contractor have a use for this machine for approximately 40 days, runs that for eight hours a day, the cost saving dash profit is about a half a million dollars, comparing to the cost of the payers. stranger to making pitches, they actually uh, made a pitch to Dragon's Den. So at this point I'd like to cup twice. They've done it twice. Has the second time been aired yet though? No, no, it hasn't been aired yet. So it's only been aired once. I'd like to call up Brian Lado and Neil Esau from CG Labs. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Neil Esau, this is my business partner, Brian Leo, and we are the owners of CG Labs. CG Labs is a DNA bank located in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, that provides a DNA banking service on site at an ultra low temperature. What we've come up with is a novel method of DNA storage where we can now store DNA at room temperature. So what this means is we can take the DNA, extract it, purify it, and stabilize it. It could be stored at home in a, in a safety lock box, put into a keepsake such as a necklace, or uh, into any item of importance for that individual. <clears throat> uh, we've also developed a method, we're working on a method, we have developed a method of uh, a living memorial. It's if someone close to you passes away, we can take the DNA which is stabilized on our substrate and, uh, sorry, and uh, 
put it into a, a tree seedling, and that tree could be planted, not only uh, planting a living memorial for the person that has passed away, but also helping the green movement and improving our environment. Uh, now, why would a person want to bank their DNA? Well, there's actually several, several reasons for doing so. DNA contains all the information that makes you, you. By, uh, it can be used to trace ancestry, uh, genetic traits, and uh, probably the most importantly is predict, uh, or sorry, diagnose inherited medical diseases. Uh, the list of current uh, known inherited diseases that, that are known in the genome is growing every year. Uh, and as, as it grows, uh, maintaining a genetic history of your family is absolutely vital in order to have that history there to not only uh, help in possible future diagnosis, but treatment or prevention could also be, for some diseases, could also be an option. Uh, however, DNA is a biological substance, and so much like everything else, it eventually degrades and uh, breaks apart and breaks down. So, at, the, at that point, you required uh, professionals in the field of DNA analysis to uh, maintain the DNA's integrity and viability for the years to come by extract, as I said, by extracting it, stay, uh, purifying it, and stabilizing it. Uh, I'm a graduate of Lakehead University uh, with an undergraduate degree in biology. Uh, I have a master's degree in DNA research, specifically in DNA damage and repair, focused on metal inhibition. As well, as, so I've been working in the field uh, with DNA for about 10 years now, um, as well as with environmental laboratory analysis. Hi, I'm Ryan Leo. Uh, I've also been in the DNA field for about 12 years. I've got a master's degree in molecular biology, undergrad in biology. I'm a forensically accredited DNA scientist, and I'm working for the cops. Uh, okay, so the business now, right? What we've developed is this DNA, we're able to put it into kind of a powder. It's 100% viable. So we're targeting the funeral industry. It's a $38 billion business in Canada and the US. Our client, there's 28,000 registered funeral providers. The trends is what's happening in the industry is cremations on the rise and squeezing their profits. So they need a different revenue source. So our products are a perfect marriage between what they need and the value to the families, right? Okay. So, what we've done so far, one of the biggest things we're having right now is educating the public. We've only been working at this, actively marketing this for four months. We've got 18 funeral homes signed up in BC. We've got seven commission salesmen starting, what, three weeks ago now? We've got uh, BC, Kamloops, Edmonton, Toronto, Quebec. Montreal. Ottawa and Montreal, yeah. So, they're just starting to approach the homes. Uh, we got a two couple local ones here. We've got uh, four or five signed up in Toronto, and we've got about 20 to 30 interested. We're going to the National Trade Show on the 3rd of June, and a lot of the people we've talked to there said they, they want to meet us face to face and see what we have for some of our products. So we're starting to get some traction in the industry, and like I said, this is only after four months. We've run an ad in a trade magazine, and we have about two or three articles in some of the major magazines uh, this month and next month coming out just focusing on our company. <coughs> So, what we're here to ask for today is $250,000 for 20% of the company. Now, the majority of this money would be spent on marketing. One of the biggest hurdles we have with this business uh, in this industry overall is educating the public on DNA. The DNA isn't scary. It's kind of been put into people's minds through science fiction stuff that DNA can be uh, manipulated and used to do really evil, awful things. But that's not, that's not the case. DNA is more uh, useful as a, as a record keeper than it is anything else. So. With, uh, with that, with this money, we would be investing most of that into our marketing campaign, as I said, to educate. Um, the younger generation is learning about DNA and the, and the basic principles of DNA in school. However, the baby boomers didn't get that education. So there's definitely a divide there. And what CG Labs is hoping to do is to bridge that gap, educating the entire public and getting everyone to understand and accept the importance of maintaining your genetic history. There's some promotional material at the back there too, so it explains our stuff a little bit better. It's, it's hard to explain this concept in five minutes. <laughs> Is there any questions? Yes. No, thank you. position for us how unusual it is to uh, be able to maintain bio so you're saying the DNA that you're preserving is viable correct? Yes. 
And how it unusual, what if, what is the normal storage procedure for DNA? It's usually stored in a, like a liquid form, frozen and stored at minus 85 Celsius. Okay, thank you. So is this not also a uh, methodology that could be embraced by any labs working with DNA material? No, we're actually experts in ancient DNA, and we came up with this uh, method by piecing together a bunch of methods, and that's working with 20,000-year-old DNA. My personal best is 7,500-year-old skull as they get a DNA from. So there's very select few people that can do this. Maybe a couple hundred in the world that do ancient DNA. Yeah, I'm confused. So, so in fact, it doesn't. So, it's your method of preservation then is not good enough for. Any they don't kind know of what they've done. We we admit it ourselves, and we're not sharing the secret. It's proprietary. proprietary trade secret. Okay, I, I guess I'm trying to understand if there's if there are other markets other than. The well, there is lots of markets. We could do the pets. We do children. Uh, we could do all that kind of stuff. But we have to focus on one market at first. Okay, so you just selected this market Well, because, because it's right. a steady market. You get the funeral home on board, the ones we have, that's a cash uh, stream for 80 years. They don't they don't jump around on price, or if they find that you, they like something with you, they'll stay with you forever. So very, very conservative, very loyal. They're hard to get, but once you get them, they stay forever. I'm a simple man. I'm, I'm a little confused about what I actually get. When, when, uh, when uh, Granny died, we got the urn. Up on the shelf. What is the urn? It's just ashes. There's nothing. Yeah. There's so, no inherent so value to that. What do I get? You get the DNA saved in whatever memento you want. Say a little plaque with the little tube inside. With the, you can have the poem on the front, or you can have it in a jewelry, or you can put it in a tree. But what this does save is now your grandkids, they develop a disease, all right? If they need to test not only your DNA, but your father's DNA and your grandfather's DNA to help diagnose and treat this disease. If you don't have those DNA, it's a lot harder. So again, a, a simple man. Um, uh, we've uncovered the human genome, and we can do it in computers. Why wouldn't I just take a, a USB disk with all all of my human genome sitting on it, lock it in my safe, so that if my children get sick? Okay, I, your grandma's at the funeral home. Did you do that to her? And you know how much it costs to do a full genome test? A lot of money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But speaking about cost, then, so I go to the funeral home and I want to get this DNA. What does the funeral home charge me and what is your cost? Well, that's something we can't really talk about. But we'll talk in private. We can't do it in an open forum because we do have local suppliers, so we can't undermine their pricing. Okay. Um, second question. Based on 250,000 for 20% interest, how did you arrive at your evaluation of the company at 1.25 million? Well, we have another offer on the table, so it's based on that. I don't think I have any questions because I'm not quite understanding where we're going here. So I'll leave it <laughs> Yeah, like I said, we have a promotional video and some pamphlets that might help you understand better what we're talking about. It's hard to get across on just a five-minute pitch what we do. It's complicated, but there's a lot of value to it. And we're getting a lot of interest in the funeral industry. Yeah. So is it possible for a living person to do this? Sure can. Absolutely. Just checking. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we've done a lot of people's children for them. They, uh, or people just dying to do this. <laughs> we've actually did quite a few pets, too. <laughs> pets. Yeah. yeah, the pet the pet one's actually really picky. People up. are crazy about their pets. And they they do DNA preservation for their pets. Yeah, they put it in whatever memoir they want. They do it in necklaces. They do it. In so so I understand that you have local sensitivities regarding uh, customers, but yeah. could you give us a range? So is it over a thousand? Under a hundred. It's under a thousand, and depending and over five hundred. Year, no, it's probably around. I'm not. I, I can't say for sure, but let's say five to six hundred dollars. Would so it's a reasonable cost. Okay. Thank you. All right. One last question. So you you sign up your five thousand funeral directors across Canada and yep. push off into the United States. Does every single test have to come back? Do, do we have to send Is it done by so, you? Some, some of, you've got to get the biological hunk yeah. material. Our costs actually go down as we get more volume. Myself and him can probably process four to 500 a day. So volume's not a problem. We go to Lakehead University and uh, get some of the molecular students from there at no cost. So we can ramp up our staff like that. 
So what is it that you need to get this sample? Is it simply if someone's cremated, you need a portion of that? Well, or after they're cremated, you cannot get DNA from that. So we have kits at the back, which we supply the homes. It's one of our costs, is that we have to supply the home with the kits and the display units up front. And we don't see a return on that until we start selling it. So every home costs us a little bit of money, but once we're in there, they're in there for life, and then we get the money back eventually. Right, and our sampling methods are completely non-invasive. Yeah. It's a cheek swab. There's no, there's no blood collecting yeah. or anything of that nature. It's a cheek swab, so it's a simple cheek, uh, cheek swab, collecting skin cells, completely painless, 20-second swab. There you go. And we have a range of products too. Like we got, like I said, we can do the living memorial. We can do necklaces. We can do just basic storage. Did I hear you correctly? You can put this DNA into a tree. Yes, you can. Yeah. That's what we call a tree seedling. So it's called our living memorial. Tree look like granny? <laughs> no. <laughs> DNA gets encapsulated Once into again, the yeah. heartwood of the tree. It doesn't become a person. What we've encapsulated into it is an encapsulated material that is maintained in the tree. So instead of, let's say, putting down a headstone, you can now plant a tree and anywhere you really want. You can put it in the yard or whatever you'd like to do with it, right? Okay. Yeah. Can you then take that DNA out of the tree later on? Not the tree, no, you can't. Yeah. You could, if you really wanted to, you could chop it up and get it done, but. Just if you want to make sure we were legit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have to close that down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, at this time we're going to break and we're going to have some networking. Feel free to mingle around and talk. If you do have a business here and business ideas, there's secret investors in the room. So talk about your business, your idea. Make sure to go back and rate the pitches you've seen so far. Give them some positive feedback. Let them know how they did. Also, if you've seen some businesses already that you want to invest your money into, the boxes are located at the back of the room. Uh, we do have three additional pitches after the networking break, so please enjoy. I deal with this daily. I'm Ryan Yeah, because I can't expose it because I can't expose it.